Hello students. So we discussed a common approach to headache. Now let us discuss few emergency condition which present with headache and how do we have to approach for those conditions. Starting with aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage. Right? Subarachnoid hemorrhage is what we will approach and we will go more on an the aneurysmal cause of the subarachnoid hemorrhage. So what is subarachnoid hemorrhage? It's a Subarachnoid hemorrhage comprises of bleeding in subarachnoid space which surrounds right brain and spinal cord surrounding brain and spinal cord. Subarachnoid hemorrhage comprises bleeding in subarachnoid space right around brain and spinal cord and most common etiology of subarachnoid hemorrhage is aneurysmal bleed right 10 to 20 percent cryptogenic bleed but mostly aneurysmal bleed. Now this subarachnoid hemorrhage has a higher predisposition for younger population right and uh, it actually not higher predisposition for younger population but a younger population is affected by this can be seen in a younger population uh, to a great extent and with a significantly high mortality. So when a young boy come with the features of headache, thunderclap headache as we discussed in the approach to headache, then this subarachnoid hemorrhage will always come in my mind, right? Because timely uh, diagnosis and timely intervention will save the patient. So it affects younger population and carries with it a significant mortality, 20 to 30 percent within 30 days and persistent neurological morbidity. If not timely approached, then there is a residual neurological morbidity associated with it. Okay. So, what are the risk factors? Because if we know the risk factors, it would be easy for us to think in that direction. The risk factors are hypertension, cigarette smoking, alcohol and history of aneurysmal bleed. Subarachnoid hemorrhage is common, has a genetic predisposition also. So, in first degree relatives, if there is a history of subarachnoid hemorrhage in the family, there is always a suspected diagnosis of subarachnoid hemorrhage can be made in patients, right? So risk factors which are very commonly seen, hypertension, cigarette smoking, alcohol intake and history of aneurysmal or subarachnoid hemorrhage in first degree relatives, okay? Patient, how does the patient present? So patient has headache. History of headache, thunderclap headache, typical kind of headache, sudden headache, syncope, plus minus syncope and persistent altered consciousness and meningismus may be present. Okay. Whenever I get this kind of patient, I have to immediately order something called NCCT. Right. NCCT 95% sensitivity if done within 24 hours. If patient has NCCT neg is NCCT negative, right? If patient is NCCT negative, right? Then we can also go for lumbar puncture and lumbar puncture xanthochromia would be seen in the lumbar puncture. So in emergency, when a patient comes with this kind of symptoms, immediately I order NCCT without delay. And if in NCCT the diagnosis of Subarachnoid hemorrhage is made, done. And how do I manage? What is the algorithm of management of subarachnoid hemorrhage? What we do in emergency department and what we send further for the neurosurgical department for management is what we have to know. So patient has subarachnoid hemorrhage. In NCCT, it is diagnosed that patient has subarachnoid hemorrhage. How do I manage it? First thing, like any other patient present in, uh, presented in emergency department, we go for ABC, airway protection, breathing, circulation, right? So we protect the airway. If altered consciousness, we always intubate the patient, right? We see the breathing. Number of times support of breathing is required. We start supporting the breathing. If breathing support is not required, we just attach oxygen, okay? And we try to maintain the circulation of patient by giving fluids, etc. Now in subarachnoid hemorrhage presented to us in emergency department can have both problems with circulation, hypo or hypertension, right? And both hypo and hypertension can make the situation worse, right? So 
what do we do right if patient already has hypotension we should avoid the emergency physician should avoid any other medication which would further cause further cause hypotension like if i am putting a tube patient already has a hypotension i will avoid those iv anesthetic agent will, will which will further cause hypotension because if we will not maintain a certain mean arterial pressure then definitely there would be cerebral perfusion compromise in the cerebral perfusion so hypertension is avoided hypotension is avoided right so whatever drug we are using for managing airway etc we need to take care or we need to select it very carefully okay now to date there is no clear cut blood pressure goal number of studies have targeted a blood pressure goal that this should be the blood pressure target blood pressure in patient with subarachnoid hemorrhage so there is no clear cut goal but there is a range right which we often have to maintain right so the american stroke association 2012 guideline says that in any uh, neuro neuro neurological catastrophe of the brain right the best blood pressure which we have to maintain the systolic blood pressure which we have to maintain should be less than 160 mm of hg so the target should be we have to that we have to maintain it below 160 mm of hg we don't have to keep it high more than that and we have to and we don't have to even like uh, take the patient towards hypotension right over aggressive management of blood pressure can lead to under perfusion and ischemia of the brain tissues so target upper blood pressure should be 160 right we should target around 160 mm of hg if it is above 160 mm of hg then only we try to re reduce it okay okay close monitoring right should always be done along with uh, like emergency physician should always involve neuro specialist neuro neuro specialist neuro surgeon neurologist in management of this of the patients to achieve the right uh, right blood pressure in that particular patient so whenever like you have a di you have diagnosed you have diagnosed subarachnoid hemorrhage and you have started the management and you are now planning to shift your patient to the surgery department or uh, neurosurgery department you have to meanwhile talk with the neuro physician neuro surgeon and manage your manage accordingly that you have you have to talk with them and you have to keep a target blood pressure what they are suggesting what is right for the patient right you don't have to put the patient in hypotension you don't have to take the patient in hypertension right so target blood pressure has to be maintained now after abc that is airway breathing and whatever blood pressure circulation you have to maintain the level of circulation you have to maintain the next part is disability so after abc we have to see the disability management we have to do a neurological assessment and neurological assessment is done by two ways of assessment gcs scoring or avpu scoring right alert vocal responsive to vocal stimulus responsive to pain stimulus or unresponsive patient why this gcs or avpu scoring is required this will help us further in the management and it will also assess the risk of the patient and also it will predict the mortality in the patient right so there are lot of classification of subarachnoid hemorrhage on their clinical presentation and amount of hemorrhage their mortality associated and risk associated with it so we can assess the risk after these scoring systems so we also do this for risk assessment and it also helps us in management now apart from disability association after avc airway breathing and circulation we have to take care of few more things in uh, uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage patient we may require to give this in this, these patients anti convulsant prophylaxis right we have to control pain anxiety in these patient we may need to give laxative in these patients right so it is not necessary that every patient may require anti convulsant prophylaxis there is some controversy in using anti convulsant prophylaxis in subarachnoid hemorrhage patient i will discuss about it right but if it is required we start anti convulsant prophylaxis after talking with the neurospecialist right 
we may order a cerebral angiography to know the exact location and for diagnosing any other aneurysm as well right and if patients icp is increasing and patients consciousness is deteriorating then an emergency evd external ventricular drain may be required to put in this patient so maybe we will require to put evd okay now number of times subarachnoid patient, hemorrhage patients may not be aneurysmal bleed may be due to a uh, trauma also this can happen rarely but can happen right so after disability right after the management we just do a fast assessment for any injury we do a fast assessment for any injury so now patient in emergency department only before shifting a risk assessment is done risk ass assessment is done and this risk assessment will tell us about the the chances of mortality and morbidity in these patients so there are two ways of uh, risk assessment one is world federation of neurosurgical grading system in soft subarachnoid hemorrhage and other is hunt and hess classification okay both these classification wfns world federation of neuro surgery grading system for subarachnoid hemorrhage and hunt and hess which i will discuss after this slide both are a grading system of in subarachnoid hemorrhage patient which assesses the risk and mortality right so wfns scale says grade has grade 1 to 5 right it incorporates in it gcs and motor deficit so if the patient has 15 by 15 of gcs and there is no motor deficit he belongs to wfns grade 1 and if the patient gcs is between 12 to 14 and again motor deficit is not there then he belong to 2 if the same gcs that is 12 to 14 with motor deficit present then wfns grade grading 3 if the gcs decreases from become 7 to 12 and with motor deficit present or absent right then it is 4 and further gcs deteriorates that is 6 3 to 6 motor deficit present or absent not significant because it with low gcs maybe we will not be able to elicit the motor response right so as the w f n s grade is increasing the chances of mortality in the patient is increasing when the patient is in the lower grade then there is a high chance with a successful surgical management of aneurysmal clipping patient can be can survive without any deficit okay apart from wfns grades we have hunt and hess grading system also it also has grade 0 to 5 right 0 to this is hunt and hess as grading system and it also is a index of perioperative mortality right in what grading there would be less chance of perioperative mortality and and where there is a high chance so it also predicts the risk in these patients okay so if the subarachnoid hemorrhage subarachnoid uh, your an uh, your aneurysm aneurysm in the subarachnoid patient it has not ruptured aneurysm has not ruptured then if patient is taken for surgery and clipping is successfully done the mortality is very less it is 0 to 5% right aneurysm has ruptured but patient is asymptomatic or minimal rigid right and with slight knuckle with minimal headache and slight knuckle rigidity right asymptomatic mostly or with minimal headache slight rigidity then again 0 to 5% risk is associated with it with surgery right severe headache knuckle rigidity but no neurological involvement then 2 to 10% right 2 to 10% mortality risk right patient is gcs becomes low confused right poor and focal deficit neurological medium focal deficit then again mortality increases 10 to 15% patient is stuporous comatose right patient is has a very low gcs right then 6 to 70% mortality and deep coma and decerebrate rigid uh, 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 decerebrate 
rigidity moribund kind of patient no response right patient has no response patient is in deep coma then mortality is very high 70 to 100% so depending upon the clinical aspect and the situation and the and the aneurysm the mortality of the patient varies now by these two classification in emergency department the risk is assessed and page risk is assessed and noted in the file of the patient and patient is sent for definitive management so what is the definitive management subalkanoid hemorrhage is managed definitely by clipping or coiling of the aneurysm right clipping or coiling and this can be best managed only in tertiary center so definitely patient has to be shifted to the tertiary center patient has to be shifted where the neurosurgery is available neurosurgery department is available neurosurgery icu is there for further management of the patient what is the role of emergency physician emergency department physician has major role in early diagnosis and prompt transfer of the patient where better management of subarachnoid hemorrhage can take place right now number of studies have shown that if the clipping of the aneurysm is done within 24 hours of the onset of the symptom right the chances of survival is maximum that right? so very very important is that patient diagnosed very fast and shifted to the centers where the service of clipping is available if intervention occurs within 24 hours of the symptoms then chances of survival of the patient is high definitely now it is subjective if the patient has come to the emergency department in later stage or in delayed state the chances of survival becomes very poor in the patient but the responsibility of ed physician is for early diagnosis and early shifting okay meanwhile he is managing the diagnosis and shifting the other things which he sh which the emergency physician should do is that he should control the blood pressure of the patient and if the uh, maintain the blood pressure within the limit which we talked about in the earlier slides and one very important i told you that the role is that we have to shift the patient as fast as possible to the neurosurgery centers if the patient present to us late right then we have to think for the complications of subarachnoid hemorrhage and one very important complication of subarachnoid hemorrhage is vasospasm definitely vasospasm is has to be managed in icus right but when a patient comes with a delayed presentation with after talking with neurophysician neurospecialist one drug can be started which has proven a good role in preventing vasospasm in different studies which modulates the vascular flow by preventing the influx of calcium into smooth muscle i right and is associated with improved outcome is nimodipin so nimodipin can be started routine use of nimodipin has been recommended with the evidence 1a right by american stroke association management right that this is one drug which has shown a very valuable contribution in prevention of vasospasm so we can give it either oral or through ng nasogastric tube right so oral or nasal nasogastric do dosing can be done okay okay now i talked about that in management anti seizure prophylaxis should be given number of studies have shown that uh, now anti seizure the uh, anti epileptic drug has no proven benefit questionable benefit even uh, if phenytoin or levetiracetam uh, anything has been used right even phenytoin or levery levetiracetam has been used it has not shown to reduce the seizure seizure uh, in these patients so prophylaxis is not showing prevention of the seizure in this patient so question of giving prophylaxis is is questionable right so whether we should use these drugs for prophylaxis or not it is questionable right so what is done in these patient so routine use of nimodipin is currently recommend, recommended in these patients 
Now, I talked about anti seizure prophylaxis in these patients, right? I told you it is questionable. Some centers prefer to use anti seizure prophylaxis, but studies have shown that giving prophylaxis is not preventing seizure in subarachnoid hemorrhage. So, anti seizure prophylaxis is questionable. Uh, neither phenytoin nor any other anti epileptic medication has shown some clear cut benefit. So, what should be our focus in these patients that if they pay, there is a seizure in these patients? So, management is according to the seizure management, right? We have to ensure ABC as we, will, we have discussed in seizure video also management of seizures. We have to ensure ABC, we have to administer IV benzodiazepine, right? And we have to shift the patient to ICU etc. if required and consultation with neurosurgeon and intensivist, we have to further give the medications, right? What are the risks in subarachnoid hemorrhage? What are the things with high risk? Is re-bleeding. Number of times if the management is not fast, if the management is not proper, then re-bleeding can occur and patient further can deteriorate and ventricular arrhythmia is very common. So, whenever we have a patient with suspected subarachnoid hemorrhage, we always be ready to manage the arrhythmias. We always should have defibrillators, right, etc., for giving shock, etc., and ventricular fibrillation patients, right? So, defibrillator means to manage to do CPR in these patients should always be in the corner of our mind. Till we shift the patient to the neurosurgical center for a definitive management, right? So, disposition of these patients from emergency department should be done to the neurosurgical centers where neurosurgical ICUs and provision of aneurysm clipping is available. Okay, thank you.